Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Johanny Grossman. I'm the team leader of the Green Corruption Program at the Basel Institute on Governance uh, and the co-convener of the Corrupting the Environment series. Uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, everybody here and um, have you participate in this sixth iteration of our series uh, of discussions on the intersection of corruption, environmental degradation, and illicit trade. Uh, and for those of you who are tuning in for uh, maybe uh, not the first time, you'll, you'll, see, you'll have seen that we've covered quite a bit of uh, ground in terms of topics and uh, illicit crimes uh, and engagements. Uh, and, and you're of course able to see the earlier versions of these videos uh, online. Um, a few householding items before we start on the substance. Um, as usual, uh, the question and answer function is enabled. You'll be able to ask uh, questions uh, of the panelists. Uh, and, and I encourage you strongly to, to do that actively because we have a fantastic panel uh, that is very happy to answer your questions. Um, and uh, we will also, uh, and the panelists have been encouraged to answer them uh, during the discussion where possible, but we will also leave some time at the end uh, to allow uh, responding some of them to some of them live. Um, so with the householding out of the way, um, I wanted to just very briefly um, introduce the topic, which is a totally new topic to our series. Uh, of course, the, the illegal waste uh, trade is not one that is well known. Um, it is uh, rarely mentioned, in fact, uh, among environmental crimes, uh, but that's not because of its scale. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this because I have to admit for me also, it was a, a surprise when I learned that the scale uh, of the illegal waste uh, trade is between 10 and 12 billion US dollars a year. Um, that's a big number, uh, so that sounds impressive already, but if you put it into to contrast, so for example, the illegal wildlife trade, which we've been talking about extensively and which is very well known and, and uh, discussed quite frequently, is about twice that. So, so the scale uh, of uh, illegal waste trafficking is certainly not commensurate with the attention the topic is getting. Um, and that's perhaps because uh, waste is not something we like to talk about. There's sort of an, a negative emotional attachment as opposed to the uh, wildlife trade, which of course is the opposite. And we all have very strong affection towards wildlife. Um, so I, my suspicion is that that's perhaps the reason why it's getting a lot less attention. Uh, but that's also a risk because as those of us in the anti-corruption and governance world know, less attention means less scrutiny and that means more risk to corruption. Um, and so I'm very pleased to see that we have a fantastic panel of speakers um, who will be able to illustrate uh, and illuminate this issue for us uh, in, from, from different perspectives. Um, uh, and, and I won't spend much time talking about the, the characteristics of the illegal waste trade because others are doing it, but I did want to, to just mention a few points that that's, uh, were noteworthy to me. And, and one of them is, of course, the vast volume. Uh, we're talking about really mass movement of goods. Uh, and, and of course, that uh, in turn um, elevates the importance and the role of shipping companies that they play in the process. Um, we see that the, the geographical flow of, of waste is quite different from the illicit trade routes that we've been looking at in regards to wildlife and, and timber and, and fish trafficking um, in the sense that almost all of it originates from, from rich countries. Um, we, we see a heavy prevalence of, of the laundering of licit and the illicit trade, which is a, a theme we've observed before. Uh, in other topics, but not to this degree, I would argue. Uh, and of course, the, the relative prominence of organized crime, uh, relatively higher prominence of organized crime, which, which uh, some of our panelists will also talk to um, during the panel. Um, so uh, given that the topic receives so little attention, it's, I think, noteworthy that a new report uh, from the Financial Action Task Force came out just three days ago uh, on environmental crimes. It's a fantastic report. Those of you who haven't read it yet, you absolutely should. Uh, we'll put a link into the, the chat section. 
um, and it covers forestry, mining, and, and waste trafficking. Uh, and, and I would argue that it's very unusual that it covers waste trafficking. And so when, when we learned about this, we were very keen to get FATF to, to come and share the findings from this report. It's hot off the presses, as I mentioned. Um, and so that gives me the opportunity to introduce our first speaker, uh, Ailsa Hart, who is a po policy analyst at the FATF Secretariat. Uh, she has over six years experience in financial crime policy and research and leads FATF's environmental crime work uh, from, uh, from Paris, from its headquarters in Paris. Um, and uh, in recent years, she supported the development of FATF's report on financial flows from wildlife crime, also a fantastic report if you haven't seen it. And of course, the, the new report that just came out three days ago uh, on money laundering from forestry, crime, illegal mining and waste trafficking. Uh, prior to joining FATF, she worked on human security issues, including refugee rights in London and Egypt, and she holds degrees from uh, Sciences Po and the University of St. Andrews. So um, without further ado, uh, Ailsa, could you talk a little bit about the uh, illicit financial flows related to the illegal wildlife trade? Uh, sorry, see, this is, this is how prevalent the topic is. It's already stuck in my mind. The illegal waste trade, of course, and how it makes it different from other environmental crimes um, uh, as, as identified in your, your report. Um, we also um, talked about the fact that um, waste is characterized as an environmental product with negative value. And I think that's, that's very unique among other environmental crimes, um, as opposed to, to timber and minerals, which are also the subject of your report. So I'm curious how, how that affects the financial crime picture associated and, and the government's responses. And finally, if I may, um, what are the key recommendations that the report makes in regards to the illegal waste trade? So uh, I'm handing it over to you, Elsa. Thank you very much. Thanks, Johanny, uh, for the questions and for the, for the introduction. Uh, we're really excited to be here today to share the, the findings of this new FETF report. Um, before diving into the topic, we want to first talk about why money laundering from, from waste trafficking is so important and why the FETF is looking at this topic. So in comparison to other environmental crimes like forestry crime or wildlife trafficking, waste trafficking is one of the le lesser known areas of environmental crime. But it's an enormous criminal enterprise, as Johanny was laying out. We're talking about waste trafficking today. So this is the export or import of waste in violation of domestic laws or international conventions, such as the Basel Convention. But crimes also occur throughout the processing chain from the collection stage to the illegal treatment and disposal of waste. It's also primarily a financial crime. So criminals make millions through savings by skipping treatment or disposal costs but also through proceeds from resale or energy recovery from, from waste that is illegally sourced. As Johanny mentioned, most um, proceeds estimates for this, this crime area put the, the crime at around 10 to 12 billion US dollars per year. So that puts this crime on a par with estimates for massive crime areas like migrant smuggling. So this, this really is a, a big issue. Um, but it goes beyond the financial costs. And um, we also see that waste trafficking fuels poverty, has massive pollution impacts for, for the environment, and also fuels corruption. So, so it's, a, it's an enormous issue. Um, and there are signs that the proceeds from this, this, this crime are going to continue to grow as the population expands. And we see increasing recycling policies across countries there'll be increasing opportunities for organized crime across, across waste trafficking. So why is FETF looking at this issue? FETF is a global standard setter for anti-money laundering, recognized in 2019 that there was a need to strengthen understanding on financial flows from environmental crime. This started with a report on wildlife trafficking last year, and the latest report covers financial flows from forestry crime, illegal mining and waste trafficking. And we're gonna focus on that final topic today. The key driving force behind this latest report is the current FETF German presidency, 
as well as colleagues from Canada, Ireland, and the UNODC that, that led this work. So FHF chose to look at waste trafficking specifically due to the significant criminal proceeds generated, but also as an area where government action to follow the money could make a big impact. It's also important to recognize that illegal management and trade in waste is an enormous topic and um, that covers many different types of waste and has distinct um, supply chains. So this is typically categorized into hazardous and non-hazardous waste and covers a range of different materials such as plastics, electronics and toxic waste among others. The FETF's work focused specifically on financial flows from organized and large scale trafficking in hazardous goods such as electronics or e-waste, like old computers or telephones, as FETF countries identified this as the number one financial crime threat within waste trafficking. So I now want to turn to your questions, Johanny, on the similarities and differences across financial, financial flows for environmental crimes. In terms of similarities, I want to focus on three key areas. The first one is corruption. Across the financial flows for environmental crimes, we saw that corruption and bribery were an enormous enabling factor across forestry crimes, illegal mining and waste trafficking. This includes bribery for government con contracts and access to natural resources, but also um, bribery of port and customs officials. While corruption is relevant for most uh, financial crimes, the important role of politically exposed persons in managing access to natural resources and contracts makes this a particular vulnerability for environmental crimes. Secondly, on the money laundering techniques, we found that generally criminals are relying on some similar money laundering techniques across um, forestry crimes, waste trafficking, uh, legal mining. Um, I want to highlight two uh, today. The first one is that criminals are regularly hiding behind legitimate front companies to mix legal and illegal goods and proceeds and to hide their criminal origin. And this typically would take the form of a legal waste company or a legal logging company that would engage in both legal and illegal trade and then mix the payments across these two business lines. For environmental crimes, this is a particularly effective strategy because it can be very difficult for authorities in the private sector to distinguish between legal and illegal trade. It's not like drug trafficking, where there is a clear divide uh, between what is legal and illegal. Uh, for waste trafficking, the difference between illegal and illegal trade can be as simple as what the, de what the, the destination country is for, for the shipment or how the waste is actually stored. Um, in the shipment, so it can be very difficult to, to distinguish. The second common money laundering technique that we saw was a heavy reliance on trade-based money laundering and trade-based fraud across environmental crimes, including waste trafficking. Criminals are relying on false documents and mislabeling goods, as well as under and over invoicing of shipments um, and phantom uh, invoices. For waste trafficking specifically, Criminals often misdeclare waste as non-hazardous or as a second-hand good because this um, skips some of the, the custom, customs checks and is not subject to the, the Basel Convention. The final similarity I want to, to mention across the environmental crimes and the financial flows that we identified was the common, uh, the common challenge in detecting these financial flows really stems from the complex regulatory landscape across these crime areas. For example, to identify funds from waste trafficking or legal logging or wildlife trafficking, this often requires a specialist knowledge of um, market dynamics or relevant international conventions, such as the Basel or the CITES Convention that define the legal trade. So it's a very specialist area um, that requires a unique knowledge. Now, turning to the differences in terms of what makes financial flows for waste trafficking unique, I want to talk about two, two key points. Firstly, as Johanny mentioned, um, unlike wildlife or forestry crime, where the flows of goods usually move from developing to developed countries, 
for waste trafficking, most of the flows go from developed to developing countries. And this includes enormous um, waste markets from the EU and North America to Asia, Southeast Asia and West Africa, among others. This has an impact on the direction of the financial flows. Unlike waste trafficking um, and illegal logging, where we saw that the majority of the profits ended up in the consumer or the demand countries, for waste trafficking, many of the profits remained in the exporting countries, with importing countries only generating part of the profits from resale or reuse of certain waste. And the second key difference for waste trafficking is that we found that compared to other environmental crimes, the money laundering techniques that criminals are using to conceal their proceeds for waste trafficking are generally less sophisticated than other environmental crime areas. For example, in the illegal logging cases received, we saw frequent use of corporate um, co complex corporate structures or offshore financial centers. And for wildlife trafficking, we saw use of underground banking, um, underground mo money value transfer services. And for waste trafficking, this was not the case. In a way, this is good news because it, it offers more opportunities for, for detection um, of financial flows from waste trafficking because the, the flows generally seem um, more, more simplistic. As mentioned, another unique uh, characteristic of waste trafficking is that the disposal and treatment of most waste costs money for businesses. So this means that most waste has a negative value unlike um, mined gold or illegally harvested uh, logs or rosewood. This has an impact on the asset recovery. Um, so for example, in, instead of assets um, like luxury cars or cash, that there's an incentive for countries to recover or repatriate these assets. For waste trafficking, there are potentially significant costs for countries of origin to recover uh, the criminal assets. This has important impacts on the, the incentives, uh, like I was saying, for, for asset recovery. So how can the public and private sector detect financial flows from, from waste trafficking? Many of the laundering cases received for the FETF study on waste trafficking were identified through tax offences and audits. This shows the importance of regular dialogue between tax authorities, financial and environmental investigators. For the private sector, the FUTF's report highlights the importance of knowing your customer, particularly those operating in the waste sector, and knowing what typical um, market prices would look like to identify where businesses are clearly undercutting costs or going through the black market. For specific risk indicators, you can refer to the FETF's report. Um, at the end of the report, we have a, a list of risk indicators for the, the three main crime areas that we touch on in the report. So what are the top messages for governments and private sector to take away from, from this report? I want to focus on three, three key messages to take away. The first one is that despite enormous criminal proceeds from environmental crimes, less than half of countries have considered this threat within their national money laundering risk assessment. This is really important because these risk assessments help determine the allocation of resources and also the priorities across um, governments. Therefore, both governments and the private sector, such as banks, need to consider their risk exposure to laundering from waste trafficking as well as other environmental crimes. And secondly, financial investigators and anti-money laundering authorities need to take this issue more seriously. This is particularly the case for waste trafficking that has been an overlooked issue so far. And this includes coordinating with environmental authorities on a more regular basis and providing guidance and outreach to the private sector on financial, suspicious financial activity that they should be looking for. And lastly, countries need to fully implement the FATF standards as an effective framework to combat laundering from waste trafficking and environmental crimes. The FATF standards provide useful tools, such as powers to identify ultimate owners behind complex companies, and also collect and, collect and exchange financial intelligence 
But these tools are being underutilized in the fight against waste trafficking and other environmental crimes. Thanks very much for the, the opportunity to share some of these initial findings. Um, and if anyone has questions, we're happy to answer them. And you can also access the full report on the FETF public website. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ailsa. And uh, well, there, there are so many interesting points here that that uh, I certainly won't be able to, to reiterate all of them, but I did want to, to focus very briefly on this, this issue of inverse asset recovery incentives. I think that's really fascinating because as we, as we all struggle to make asset recovery a more uh, active part of um, law enforcement efforts, of criminal enforcement efforts, um, I don't think we're quite ready for all the implications that that, that brings about. So um, maybe that's the subject of a whole different webinar. Um, but, but thank you again, Elsa, very much. Uh, I appreciate the, the very succinct overview of what is a fascinating report. And, um, and again, I can encourage everybody to, to read the report. It's, it's really a, a worthwhile read. Okay, so um, moving along, um, I would like to introduce our, our next speaker. Uh, who is Nancy Izarin. Uh, Nancy is an uh, independent expert with over 20 years of experience uh, in the enforcement of waste shipment regulations and combating illegal waste trafficking. Uh, she started her career as an environmental inspector uh, and was a, me a member of the National Task Force on Serious Environmental Crime in the Netherlands. Uh, and since 2006, she, she's been supporting uh, and leading various international initiatives that aim to control waste trade, uh, disrupt illegal trafficking, support operational enforcement collaboration, increase the capacities of law enforcement agencies, and enhance the prosecution of environmental crimes. Uh, clearly, she has, she has very broad expertise. She works with a range of international organizations, including the UN Environmental Program, the World Customs Organization, UNODC, and the World Bank, uh, among many others. Um, and uh, I would like uh, to ask Nancy, to um, elaborate a little bit um, on, on some of the topics raised before, um, in particular about the international trade regulations related to waste uh, and the weaknesses that, that criminals uh, can exploit in these trade regulations. Um, and of course, when we talk about criminals, we're talking about, well, in this particular case, we're talking about uh, organized crime sometimes, but we're also talking about corporate actors um, as, as Ailsa mentioned, there's a risk of front companies and, and those sorts of methods. Um, and then the, the second question I have for Nancy is uh, based on uh, her experience working in a country that probably belongs primarily to the, the source countries, um, whether she could speak about the incentives uh, that exist in those countries uh, to address this crime, which again, they're, they're more, or they're different. I don't want to say they're more complex, but they're different from other types of environmental crimes that we deal with. So over to you, Nancy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Johanny, for this uh, introduction and having me as the panelist for this, uh, for this webinar. Um, li listening to the previous speaker, I, I, I had to maybe already change some of the things I wanted to say, not to have too much overlap, but uh, I think anyway, it would be good to, to repeat some of the things that were said by uh, Ms. Hart. Um, also, because uh, I look to the issue more from an environmental investigation uh, perspective. Um, so just a few words on the, on the international trade uh, in waste, as it's quite an unknown uh, area for, for, for most, of, uh, most of you. Um, so the trade in waste, especially the international trade, is uh, quite a complex uh, system. Uh, many different actors are involved uh, on the private side, but also on the governmental or public sector uh, side. So uh, on the private side, you have companies that are responsible for shipping the waste, uh, collecting the waste, storing waste, uh, treating the waste, but you also have uh, shipping lines uh, and quite a complex network of waste brokers and waste dealers. Uh, and then from the governmental side, uh, you have stakeholders such as the, the licensing authorities. Uh, and here already uh, you see a, a split for licensing authorities for, for uh, waste treatment uh, sites to operate. And then can be separate authorities uh, that issue uh, the notifications and the consent for the transboundary movement of waste. 
then you have the environmental inspectors. This can also be, depending on the country and their system, uh, can be at, at different levels, uh, local uh, inspectors uh, on the province level or, or national uh, environmental inspectorates. And of course, uh, police and, and customs administrations also play an important role in the uh, compliance checking uh, of, uh, of waste shipments. Uh, and then there are some fertility facilities that can even be uh, owned, uh, shared owned by uh, by uh, competent authorities or uh, or public sector and uh, private enterprises such as port authorities and port waste reception facilities. Um, so when you look to the main drivers behind the waste rate, uh, it's cost for transport and treatment of the waste on one hand, and also the demand for secondary. Uh, materials, uh, on the other hand, that are of main influence on where the waste will end up for uh, for treatment, and therefore making this is a, a global uh, business, uh, and and, and can, which can vary depending on on the on the situation on, on trade uh, policies, uh, market prices, and of course on, on national policies on uh, waste uh, treatment. Uh, the example already given by. Uh, as I was the uh, the plastic in uh, the trade in plastic waste, uh, whereby the the more developed countries do not have enough capacity to deal with their plastic waste that is generated uh, at the domestic level, and it's therefore then exported to other parts of the world for recycling, uh, which maybe be of lower standards than they uh, that would be uh, preferred. So if you look to the legal framework for, for waste uh, management and waste shipments, uh, the mention of the Basel Convention uh, is, is of course of, uh, of essence. So in 1992, the Basel Convention on the control of transboundary movements of hazardous waste and their disposal came into effect. Uh, this international agreement is signed by 188 parties, uh, which then of course must implement the convention into their national uh, uh, the, a legislative framework. Uh, and here already we see that not all of these parties have implemented all the provisions of the convention into their national uh, legislative framework, uh, which uh, can lead then uh, also to some uh, gaps and challenges in the enforcement of these uh, kind of provisions. And it's also noteworthy to say that not all um, developed countries have signed uh, this, this convention, uh, such as uh, the United States, uh, which of course are, are um, yeah, one of the bigger parties that generate a lot of waste and therefore export a lot of waste, uh, but that do not always follow the uh, provisions under the Basel Convention. Uh, so just very short, uh, what the main uh, control framework is for cross-border movements of hazardous waste. Um, so the movement of hazardous waste um, is either prohibited, so completely banned, or it requires uh, prior uh, consent by the authorities involved, which means the country of export. Uh, if there's a country of transit, they also have to give uh, consent. And of course, the country of import. Uh, and key uh, to uh, give this uh, consent uh, by the country of import is, of course, the, the insurance or the security that the waste is managed uh, according to a certain standards. Uh, this whole uh, licensing approval process can be quite long and, and costly, which is, is a challenge for the well-willing uh, companies that want to comply with the, with the provisions. Uh, so that's for hazardous uh, waste and certain waste streams that require special uh, consideration. And then on the other hand, you have the non-hazardous waste, which in principle can be shipped under lighter conditions with, with a few uh, exemptions. Um, so in practice, actors, uh, either individuals or companies, um, they will try to avoid high costs for, for waste treatment. Uh, and these costs for waste treatment are not only driven by the technology used to treat the waste, but also uh, other costs like labor costs, costs for safety measures, and costs to comply with national laws and environmental regula regulations. This means that actors involved in the waste management chain with perhaps some less honest intentions, uh, will try to avoid um, the, the regulatory uh, system and, and controls. Uh, and as said, a uh, common modus operandi that we see is that they will try to classify certain uh, waste streams, not as waste, but as secondhand goods, um, or they will uh, classify hazardous waste on paper as non-hazardous, uh, 
uh, where they would circumvent the rules uh, for, for this uh, type of shipment of waste. And they can do this, for example, by falsifying uh, documents. Uh, another important uh, thing that, that adds to the problem of waste crime is that um, well, it's driven by high profits uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's also a very low risk of detection. And once uh, um, a possible case of illegal uh, waste trafficking has been detected, prosecution is rare and conviction rates and penalties are quite low. Uh, so this combined then also with uh, danger to human health and, uh, and the environment, it's also a threat to security, uh, social and economic development. Uh, as said earlier, it's known to be linked to other types of offenses such as corruption, tax evasion and fraud. Um, however, the link with organized crime, maybe in some cases it's quite obvious, but not in all. And this is also due to the fact how organized crime is uh, def uh, defined uh, and the involvement of uh, um, yeah, corporations or, or corporate crime and how does it link with serious or, or organized crime. So there is also a big challenge for the law enforcement community on, on how to deal with these different interpretations of organized and versus corporate crime. Uh, and of course, we probably are all aware of, of, of the involvement of criminal networks that not only are involved with waste crime or environmental crime, but also other types of crime like um, uh, drugs trafficking. Um, as said, the waste trafficking manifests itself, for example, by misclassification of the waste, but also falsifying uh, the destinations uh, declared in the paper, uh, in the paperwork. Uh, lack of authorization for the shipment, uh, unsound management of the waste, and the use of fake certificates about the composition of the, of the waste. So this is just a brief overview of, of the international weight trace and some of the weaknesses and, and, and risks. Um, and then zooming a bit more in on the, on the corruption uh, part, which I did, and, and less on the money laundering, is that um, Waste trafficking is a crime that is partly facilitated by the corruption of public officials. Um, so for example, the ones in charge of issuing permits, uh, but also law enforcement officials and inspectors and customs officers uh, performing the actual checks of shipments of waste, but also the sites uh, where waste is stored or, or treated. And in some cases also uh, politicians are involved uh, who can, for example, ease the, the bureaucratic uh, process to, re to receive or achieve permits uh, based on false, uh, falsified documents. Uh, the corruption can be active or passive. Uh, so uh, for example, it can be that a customs officer will turn a blind eye at the border if a shipment of waste is passing. Uh, but as I said, uh, it, officials can also um, sign off on uh, certain licenses obtained based on falsified information. And by allowing this illegal or illicit trade to happen, uh, human health and environment are willingly put at risk. Um, in terms of the tools available for, for the law enforcement community, in, in my case, um, uh, first of all, I would like to say that the, the, the issue of corruption is not yet uh, taken enough into account when investigating waste crime. Uh, first, because um, in many cases, people are unaware of it. Uh, and on the other hand, it's also quite a sensitive topic to, 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 uh, to touch upon. Um, and then secondly, there, um, there are also not enough tools to support uh, the investigators, uh, such as the performance of, of financial investigations, or at least having the involvement of, uh, of a financial investigator in the investigative um, team. Uh, and as said, also the lack of uh, interagency collaboration between authorities at the national level, uh, but also at the international uh, level. Um, so it's, it's, it's still in that sense at the beginning of, of the awareness and, and trying to apply and develop tools that will help and aid the, the uh, waste crime investigation teams to, to take this aspect uh, into account. So there is still a big gap and I would, yeah, I would argue or, or, or plea to, to have this more involved and embedded in this type of investigations. Uh, and then one other thing I did not really prepare, but I think it might be also good to, to, to realize, and it's not uh, linked directly to corruption, but uh, on another part that is related to the financial investigation of uh, waste crime, 
is also how to calculate the costs of environmental damage. Uh, this is also, especially prosecutors uh, are always keen to have a figure on what is, what is the cost, what is the, the financial cost of the environmental damage that has been done. And also here, this is an area that needs further um, yeah, work and development in terms of tools and calculation methods. So with that, I would like to close my intervention. Thank you. Nancy, thank you so much for this very comprehensive overview. Um, for those of us who are, who are not as well versed in this, it was really uh, insightful and, and helpful. Um, and of course, uh, any mention of the importance of uh, uh, elevating the role of financial investigations and financial investigators is always music to my ears because that's what uh, a big part of the Institute's work is in, in environmental crimes. Um, and, and I actually have a, a few questions that I, I want to ask you, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave space for that later on. So thank you again, Nancy, uh, and we'll, we'll come back uh, during the Q&A. Um, so uh, moving along, I now have the, the chance and the opportunity to introduce our next speaker, who in a way represents a, a contrast. Um, uh, uh, Yazid Norhuda, Mr. Yazid Norhuda comes from Indonesia. Uh, he is the head, uh, uh, he's the director of criminal law enforcement at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. Um, I've had, the, I've had the, the pleasure of spending almost 10 years in Indonesia until recently. And so um, I, I am well, well aware of how, uh, um, well, I'm well aware how unaware those of us in Europe are about Indonesia and uh, its size and importance. Uh, size in terms of population, almost 300 million people, of course, but also uh, biodiversity importance and preserving Indonesia's biodiversity, of course, is crucial, not just to Indonesia, but the world. Um, and so Pai Yazid in his role plays a very important role in that uh, the, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry of the Republic of Indonesia um, it was, was combined a few years ago. So it used to be Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Forestry separately. They're, they're now joined. Um, it has quite extensive law enforcement functions. And so uh, Payazit's um, uh, role can really not be overstated here. Um, and he has long experience with the ministry. He worked at the Inspector General of the ministry. So I'm sure he has a, a thing or two to share with us also about uh, internal controls and internal risks. Um, he was the director of complaint handling, monitoring, and administrative sanctions uh, prior to taking on his current role. Uh, and he's also been involved in the uh, discussions, negotiations, and meetings around many international treaties, uh, including, including, of course, uh, the Basel Convention. Um, so, uh, and in his role, he has uh, been fighting all kinds of environmental crime, including mining, waste dumping, pollution, wildlife trafficking, and other crimes in the forestry sector, including money laundering. Uh, and so I think he is uniquely placed to not only tell us uh, of Indonesia's perspective, um, um, both in regards to um, its own um, uh, waste related money laundering risks, but also as sometimes the destination of waste from other countries uh, and, and the country's efforts in, in reducing those risks, but also, of course, the intersection with other types of crimes, uh, other types of environmental crimes. And so, um, and, and I should say, very important that, of course, Indonesia also provided input into the FATF report that we talked about earlier. Um, so, uh, Payazit, um, if you don't mind, could you please tell us about the the criminal trends that your ministry uh, and your team has been working on. Um, what are the, and, and very importantly, what are the investigative tools that your ministry utilizes? We, we talked about earlier a little bit that the environmental uh, investigative tools tend to be a little bit different from the financial investigative tools. Um, and then finally, uh, I think all of us, all of those of us who are based in Europe or the United States are keen to keen to learn about um, the sort of the, the drive uh, of the importing companies and the profile of the importing companies that you've been looking at it and investigating. Um, so Payazit, uh, I'll turn it over to you with that. And I understand you have some, some slides to share with us as well, right? Yes. Yes, thank, 
Yes, thank you, Jehani. Uh, I am uh, impressed that you know well about our institution. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to share our uh, opinion and share our experience on the enforcement on environmental and, and forestry sector in Indonesia. Uh, I will share uh, some slides to you to uh, in this uh, opportunity. Yes, uh, talking about the environmental forest and forestry enforcement in Indonesia, we have a strong mandate that uh, there are eight uh, laws that uh, give us the uh, authorities to enforce the criminal on the forestry and uh, environmental uh, matters. So uh, from the eight uh, laws, there are two laws that most uh, related to our discussion uh, this evening, uh, related to illegal waste trade and money laundering. The first is the law number 32, 2009, related to environmental protection and management. And the uh, most new uh, our, our mandate or authority uh, given to us is related to constitutional court verdict number 15. Uh, the, it is 29 June 2021, which is uh, yesterday. The, the, this verdict is give us uh, the authority to investigate the money laundering from the environment and forestry crime as a predicate crime. So I think uh, this is the uh, good uh, for us to that uh, have been given the adding uh, our our mandate our authority to investigate the uh, money laundering from the environment and forestry uh, crime as a predicate crime so there are uh, types of crime that we usually face in the daily activity the the first is uh, related to illegal logging and illegal trade uh, of wildlife forest encroachment forest fire and then uh, criminal uh, related to hazardous waste uh, material there, which is illegally. And then the last is environmental pollution and degradation. So the illegal traffic or illegal import of the waste, including plastic waste, is the part of environmental pollution and degradation uh, that we uh, usually uh, face in the uh, site. Uh, some, uh, uh, sometimes we have uh, faced various actors that involve in the environment and forestry crime in Indonesia. There are uh, individuals, some of them uh, state actors, organized group, uh, and then uh, some cases uh, related to politically exposed person, corporation, and also transnational. So I share the various actors here uh, to, to uh, what should I say? Yeah, to share that uh, sometimes we have many challenges. We have many uh, tense uh, to uh, enforce the in the uh, environment and force crime in Indonesia. And uh, transnational actors, as usually, we face on the illegal waste uh, uh, trade in Indonesia. And uh, we, uh, our institution, uh, uh, sorry, our institution is the Directorate General for enforcement of environment and forestry sector. This is the specific uh, director general who have the authority to enforce the laws uh, and regulation that related to uh, environment and um, uh, forestry in Indonesia. Oh, in enforcing uh, our institution, we have three types of instrument. The first is administrative sanction. In administrative sanction, we can issue the written warning, government order, fines, freezing license, and sometimes we issue the revoking of the license. And the second, we uh, also have the authority to uh, in the dispute settlement through the court or out of the court through mediation. So we 
we uh, we can uh, issue uh, sorry we can sue the uh, corporation or business activity who uh, make the environmental pollution or degradation to pay some compensation uh, to recover the environmental pollution or environmental damage and the third uh, instrument is relating to the criminal law so we uh, i have the authority to investigate uh, to investigate the criminal uh, action the uh, breaches of the forestry and uh, environmental regulation in indonesia so in the uh, site we sometimes uh, take the symbolic action such as give the warning uh, through the uh, announcement and then police align and so on and uh, in actuating uh, our instrument we uh, we hope uh, uh, the impact or outcomes which is the changes in behavior of the business in Indonesia. There are increasing compliance, deterrent effect, and recovery of environmental uh, pollution. And uh, in the four slides here, I, I just want to share the uh, result of our enforcement, uh, really uh, mainly from the environmental cases. There are actually eight cases that I have already uh, sent to the uh, court and some of the uh, offenses uh, are, are convicted criminal is sent to the jail. There are uh, person or also uh, corporate. So I will uh, skip uh, this this uh, slide and I will uh, jump to the illegal import on plastic uh, scrap. So. Along to 2019 till 2020, we uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry have the collaboration with the Indonesian custom to inspect in four port in Indonesia. In the first in port in Pelabuhan Batu Ampar in Batam, we find 532 containers that. Uh, our suspect, uh, suspected, uh, suspected. Uh, what should I say? Uh, not clean, but uh, contaminated with the uh, hazardous waste materials. So, so from 532, we found. Sorry, we found that 364 uh, containers is clean, and 160. Eight container uh, contaminated with the uh, hazardous waste. So we uh, we take the order to re-export 161, and seven container are now still uh, in Indonesia. This is in the Batu Ampar uh, port in Batam. The country of origin of the containers is comes from Australia, Belgium. Canada, France, Germany, Greece, Japan, Morocco, Netherlands, New Zealand, Poland, Singapore, Slovenia, Spanish, Turkey, and uh, USA, and also United Kingdom. And then in the uh, Tanjung Priok uh, port in Jakarta, we found uh, 16 containers that uh, clean as 14 and two contaminated, and we have already exported to the uh, country of uh, origin. And the, at the Tangerang uh, port, we found 425, which, which is 134 containers uh, contaminated to the hazardous waste, and uh, 27 has already uh, re export And still 107 containers uh, still uh, in Indonesia. So from the four ports uh, during 2019 and 2020, we inspected almost 100 and 1,121 containers, which when uh, the clean containers is consist of 698 and 432 containers is contaminated to the other materials, uh, which was not allowed to uh, uh, import it in Indonesia. 
and we have uh, already exported uh, 309 containers and the rest 114 containers still in uh, Jakarta. And then I want to share some pictures uh, related to illegally imported non-hazardous waste uh, materials that uh, this case is now under uh, in our investigation and uh, hopefully uh, not a uh, long time I will uh, send it to the uh, court. And then the second is uh, illegal import of plastic scrap and hazardous waste. We found 87 containers of waste and hazardous waste uh, which imported since May to June 2019 without any license. So uh, we uh, we investigate uh, this uh, this type of criminal, and uh, we divide it into three. Uh, what should I say? What well, do three types of investigation? So one investigation is already uh, done, and uh, now in the process. Uh, ruling in the court and two uh, two uh, investigator uh, hopefully not uh, not so uh, long uh, time I will uh, send it to the uh, court this is the same uh, picture of the illegal uh, import of uh, plastic scrap in Indonesia uh, this is a press conference on the case uh, in 2020 and uh, the potential enforcement on illegal waste trade and money no laundering in indonesia i think uh, strong mandate uh, I, as i mentioned before that uh, we have the strong mandate the strong authority that they given from two laws yeah number 232 2009 related to environmental protection and management and the most uh, fresh from the oven is constitutional constitutional court verdict number 15 dated 29 june 2021 that uh, gave uh, af the authority to investigate the money laundering uh, investigation and then the second this potential cases i think many in the future since uh, the increasing business on the waste or plastic scrap as raw materials of industry in Indonesia. So uh, the challenge that we may face in the uh, uh, invest, uh, enforcement on illegal waste trade and money laundering, that the modus operandi uh, are complex of the waste uh, trade and money laundering, and then transnational actors. And also uh, we, uh, we know that our coffee city, our investigator uh, on the subject on money laundering investigation is still low. So we uh, we have to uh, study and uh, yeah and practice uh, study and practice on the money laundering in the future. I think that's all my sharing. Uh, thank you very much. Payazid, thank you very much for this uh, very insightful overview of your work. Um, uh, especially, uh, I mean, it, it's fascinating to to see the share of containers that arrive uh, in, in, and are contaminated with hazardous waste. Uh, um, and maybe we could talk about this a little bit more during the Q and A. Um, and of course, it's always always a pleasure to have uh, somebody insightful speaking. Uh, somebody giving the insights from from a destination country as well. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule. Uh, we have one more speaker um, who I want to introduce, but we'll do so very briefly. Um, his name is uh, Antonio Pergolizzi. Um, he, he joins us from Italy, as the name suggests. Um, he is an environmental analyst and a visiting professor at the University of Camerino. Uh, and is a prolific author uh, in regards to uh, organized crime, environmental degradation, and, and corruption. Um, he's advised numerous government agencies in Italy and, and the region. Uh, he's a member of the Anti-Mafia Observatory of the Umbria region. 
uh, and has published a book, which I just have to mention the title because I think his book and the name of my program are the only ones that use the term as far as I'm aware, which is the uh, Green Corruption Emergency, How Corruption Devours the Environment. Um, Antonio uh, and I had a conversation yesterday that we recorded um, in order to allow him to speak in Italian and we've added subtitles to this. Um, uh, and so I will ask my colleagues to share the video uh, and so that we can listen to him speak. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Antonio, for, for joining us. We are recording this a, a day ahead of the webinar um, in order to ensure the, the audio quality works well enough. Um, and uh, Antonio, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, the, in, in regards to the FATF report, which um, outlines a number of case studies uh, in regards to uh, the illegal trafficking and waste, and uh, both two of the case studies are from Italy, which is, of course, your, your country of expertise. Um, I was very keen to uh, get your input in particular about the vulnerabilities uh, in the uh, in the supply chains of different types of waste. Um, it's worth noting that the FATF report highlights that the um, that uh, waste trade has been highlighted as a, a particular risk of money laundering in Italy's national risk assessment. So clearly the government is paying a lot of attention to this. Uh, but as you highlighted to me earlier, there's different supply chains and uh, presumably different vulnerabilities in the different supply chains. So if you could talk a little bit about this, what Italy's experience is in this regard to be much appreciated. Okay. Grazie per l'invito. Eh, diciamo i rifiuti eh, si strutturano in diverse filiere, quindi i rifiuti sono diverse sostanze e oggetti che si strutturano in diverse filiere che hanno dei modelli di, di, di governance e di compliance completamente diverse. Per esempio nel caso dei rifiuti urbani diciamo, sono gestiti dalle autorità pubbliche, quindi sono sotto il controllo pubblico e quindi l'illegalità si manifesta attraverso l'infiltrazione negli appalti, nei subappalti, quindi attraverso la corruzione, la green corruption, è un grande, diciamo, eh, grande problema degli appalti riguardo alla gestione dei rifiuti urbani. Mentre i rifiuti speciali, che sono circa l'80% dei rifiuti prodotti ogni anno, invece si muovono nel libero mercato, nel free market, e quindi si muovono attraverso una serie di erogazioni di servizi a costi bassi eh, offerti da coloro che violano le leggi. Quindi, le filiere in cui si articolano i rifiuti sono molteplici e, e sono molto complesse e l'illegalità si manifesta in nei diversi punti in cui si articola la filiera. Quindi se noi vogliamo capire, comprendere esattamente quanta illegalità e che tipo di illegalità si consuma, noi dobbiamo comprendere molto meglio come funzionano le filiere, perché dal mio punto di vista, studiando le singole filiere, si scoprono moltissime vulnerabilità, si, si scoprono degli spazi di discrezionalità o in cui addirittura non c'è nemmeno bisogno della corruzione o dell'illegalità perché le pieghe, cioè gli spazi che offre la norma si piega benissimo diciamo, a intromissioni eh, di tipo esterno e quindi anche a fenomeni di eh, accumulazione di capitale quindi eh, con un ruolo spiccato delle mafie e dei vari network criminali. Soprattutto nel caso dei rifiuti le mafie non si muovono attraverso una, me, una modalità mafiosa, in, in quanto diciamo, non usano la violenza, ma appunto usano i loro soldi, i loro denari per condizionare gli appalti oppure per gestire impianti, perché attraverso la gestione degli impianti consentono di intercettare i flussi dei rifiuti e portarli verso il mercato nero. L'illegalità quindi non è, una sola, non è fatta di una sola tipologia, ma sono una molteplicità di illegalità che si consumano lungo le varie filiere e per capire meglio come queste illegalità si manifestano dobbiamo conoscere meglio come si strutturano le filiere. Thank you very much. Um, that's, that's very insightful. Um, 
we we talked also a little bit about the the government's response to addressing these vulnerabilities um and and obviously italy has made quite significant headway although i'm sure some challenges continue to exist um i wonder if you could uh illustrate to us a little bit about what the measures have been that have been taken by the government eh, sicuramente l'italia anche per il fatto di avere eh, nel proprio territorio la presenza di ben cinque mafie strutturate ha sviluppato delle capacità molto molto forti noi oggi siamo uno dei paesi migliori nel contrasto alle mafie e soprattutto al modus operandi delle mafie quindi siamo molto forti nell'azione di contrasto nell'azione diciamo repressiva lo sforzo che va fatto è quello invece di potenziare l'azione di prevenzione cioè bisogna lavorare molto meglio rispetto a quello che dicevo prima, cercando di strutturare meglio i modelli di governance, cercando di muoversi attraverso profili di rischio, attraverso valutazioni di rischio, attraverso il tentativo di chiudere gli spazi in cui si muove l'illegalità. I trafficanti di rifiuti si muovono esattamente negli spazi che i sistemi di regolazione ufficiale lasciano loro aperti. Quindi sfruttano per esempio le, le carenze impiantistiche, sfru sfruttano la mancanza di visione, sfruttano l'ignoranza anche delle de della politica, delle classi dirigenti nel chiudere il ciclo uh, dei rifiuti all'interno di un ambito ristretto. Quindi lo sforzo che va fatto è quello di concentrare l'attenzione dalla fase finale, che è quella repressiva, in cui si applica il codice penale per spostare l'attenzione su tutta l'azione di prevenzione che consiste nel cercare di migliorare la governance. La migliore azione di contrasto al malaffare consiste nel migliorare la governance del sistema e di migliorare il meccanismo di compliance e di controllo. Thank you very much. Um, and then uh, finally one question that I can't resist asking um, I, I hear and read from time to time about the, the involvement, even the, the dominance uh, of organized crime in Italy in, in the illicit waste trade or illegal waste trade. Um, I, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on this, is how, how prevalent is the presence of organized crime in this, in this issue actually in reality? Allora, se parliamo di mafie, se parliamo di mafie, la loro presenza è, diciamo, Uh, concentrate in alcune aree del territorio, ma quello sì, però dal punto di vista diciamo, del, del, della loro presenza è molto relativa. Eh, il crimine legato alla gestione illegale dei rifiuti è un crimine di tipo economico e la stragrande maggioranza degli attori sono imprese, sono imprenditori, sono professionisti, sono avvocati, sono broker sono um, ingegneri eccetera quindi le mafie sono solo uno degli attori in campo sono attori importanti in molte aree del paese perché ripeto sfruttano loro, il loro controllo sociale il, la loro capacità di diciamo la loro forza economica per condizionare gli appalti appunto sono forti laddove le istituzioni sono, sono deboli Però, ripeto, la loro presenza, se guardiamo l'intero territorio nazionale, è una presenza che in molti, in, diciamo, in, in alcuni studi a cui ho partecipato, la loro presenza può essere stimata in circa il 6, dal 6 in una forbice, dal 6 al 10%. E questo ce lo dicono anche le ultime, le più importanti inchieste che stiamo andando ad analizzare, in cui si, diciamo, emerge forte il ruolo delle imprese, gli imprenditori. Purtroppo quello che constatiamo è che tutte le imprese coinvolte sono imprese che sono regolarmente in attività e che dispongono anche delle certificazioni ambientali migliori, quindi hanno, godono di certificazione ambientale, quindi godono anche di relazioni, quindi non sono dei, come dire, alieni, ma sono all'interno dello stesso settore economico, perché trafficare rifiuti è molto semplice perché basta, come abbiamo detto migliaia di volte, se basta um, eh, falsificare i documenti che accompagnano i rifiuti, basta cambiare dei singoli codici CER per trasformare quello che è un costo in un ricavo. 
perché tutto il sistema dei, dei rifiuti, la gestione, si regge su processi di, come dire, di autocertificazione in cui il controllo effettivo è molto raro. Le istituzioni non possono controllare, eh, non hanno gli strumenti, non hanno le informazioni a loro disposizione. Quindi le mafie sono solo uno degli attori, sebbene diciamo, eh, riscontrano una grande eco mediatica, quindi fanno molta notizia perché sicuramente è più notiziabile la presenza delle mafie piuttosto che altre inchieste. Però dalla nostra esperienza la gran parte delle, delle inchieste contro traffici illeciti di rifiuti vede coinvolte imprese e professionisti. Quindi le mafie sono solo uno degli attori in campo. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and we will uh, give uh, participants the opportunity to ask questions and answers after this. Uh, see you in the Q&A. All right, thank you, Antonio. And this is also an opportunity for those of you who like the spot 10 differences between his and my uh, setup today and yesterday. Um, so um, we have a few issues with the Q&A. Um, I wonder if it's just me experiencing it or my, my fellow panelists are also challenged by that. Uh, but I got a number of questions in through my colleagues from uh, who forwarded them to me via WhatsApp. So. Uh, apologies in advance if we don't get to all the questions. I'm sure we'll we'll uh, find a way to dig them up later and and respond to them separately. Um, but just to to kick us off uh, uh, briefly, um, uh, I wondered if uh, Elsa can uh, elaborate a little bit on the recommendation you made at the the beginning of the panel, talking about the role of the private sector. Uh, of course, we, we frequently talk about uh, banks and, and other financial institutions, um, but I wonder also about the role of the, the transport sector, given the, the trade volumes that, that we're dealing with here. And, and of course, I should say, if other, if other uh, panelists would like to also answer that question, by, by all means, you, you certainly have different, uh, different perspectives on the same issue. Thanks, Ioanni. Um, I, I think, as you mentioned, it requires multiple inputs from different sectors to detect this, this um, suspicious activity and the related financial flows. It's very difficult for financial institutions like banks to detect financial flows from waste trafficking without information from uh, the transport sector or public sector on, um, on suspicious activity to look out for. So it really requires um, a conscious effort across different sectors. Um, and we've seen from some of the speakers that the supply chains are constantly changing. So it really requires active uh, information exchange between the public and the private sector on what to look out for and which um, countries are, are higher risk in, in certain moments or which supply chains are higher risk. Uh, thank you very much, Ailsa. Uh, Nancy, Antonio, um, uh, do you want to come in on this? Or also pa Payazit, maybe? Well, if I may. Um, Please. Uh, I think one of the big challenges for law enforcement is to, to identify the structure behind the illegal trade. Because, you, of course, you see involvement of different countries. Uh, and, and you can come across an illegal import or export of waste. And you can treat it as a, as a one-time incident. Uh, but of course, if it happens more or if this is linked with other uh, structures in other countries or if you see that uh, inspections in one seaport are increasing, so companies will find other uh, ports to export the same waste. Um, there, at the moment, there, you, there is not enough international collaboration to identify this, these kind of structures. So it's also then difficult to see uh, the, the role of, of yeah, the, the, the private sector exactly and um, uh, to target them. So I think there's a gap also for law enforcement side uh, to have this bigger overview rather than just at the national level to, to recognize the structures. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Payazit, I wonder if I could, could expand on that question a little bit. Um, and uh, as, as, I, as I noted before, I was, I was shocked, to be honest, by the, the share of, shall we call them contaminated containers that, that you were able to, 
to uh, unearth, uh, even taken into account that perhaps the, the inspection was done of containers that were suspect, but nonetheless, uh, that, that's, a, that's a very high share. And um, I, I saw briefly on your list of companies that, that you're, you're prosecuting, um, if I understood correctly, based on the names, they, they tended to be Indonesian firms. So my, my guess is that these are the, the importers of these companies. Uh, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit uh, about one, um, what um, what other tools you have uh, other than criminal sanctions against these? You know, is there some sort of blacklist or something like that that could be created? Uh, but also, what the what your experience has been in terms of looking after the the companies that are well sending the containers uh, your way? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jahari. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> the the uh, company who, who imported the, the illegally the uh, plastic scrap in Indonesia that I investigate is the Indonesian company. But uh, the director and also uh, some of the uh, key person in the company is uh, from uh, abroad. From abroad, that is from Singapore uh, and uh, Singapore nationals, and also China. So, uh, uh, in one investigation, uh, I'm, I'm still waiting uh, the uh, person uh, who will representing the uh, company in the in the court. Uh, uh, from the uh, that person is now and still in the Singapore, and we, we are still waiting uh, for him to come to Indonesia to come to the court and representing uh, the uh, company in the court. Uh, but uh, since uh, we face still the pandemic uh, COVID 19, so uh, we still a uh, little bit uh, more. Uh, time to uh, to go to the court and uh, the second uh, you you asked me what uh, the others uh, instrument that we have that uh, we already asked the uh, administration in the uh, ministry of the uh, what was it in Indonesian we say Kementerian Hukum dan Ham, Law the Ministry and, of Justice. Yeah, yeah, Ministry of, of the Justice that uh, to freeze the the license the and the uh, what is it? Actor perusahaan the company company profile. Company registration. Uh, yeah, yeah, company registration. So uh, since we freeze the company registration, they cannot do the uh, business anything until. The uh, the court uh, this finished and the final verdict will will be uh, issued. And the second, we already sent the notice to the uh, Ministry of the Trade, yeah, the Trade to make the some of uh, announcement that the company should be noticed as uh, not a good uh, company. So, and then also uh, we try to make a communication to the Singapore authority to uh, ask uh, the person who representing the company to come to Indonesia, to come to Jakarta and representing uh, the company to the, in the court. That's all, Johani. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fayazid. That's that's really uh, insightful and the, the, the company corporate registration freeze. Oh, sorry. Yes, you wanted to add something? Yeah, since uh, we have just the new authorities, the new mandate for the uh, money laundering. So I think this, uh, this the, uh, the fresh blood for us as an investigator in the environment and uh, the chance to take the action on investigation on money laundering in the illegal waste trade is uh, I think uh, I, I will I will have the case on that 
but the most uh, challenging for us is to or to, to increase our uh, capacity our capability to asset tracing and also uh, the related to export import and uh, communication and collaboration with the other enforcement officer in uh, another country right Th thank you that that's a, you're making a really important uh, point and again music to my ears when we talk about the need for for capacity building in regards to financial investigations and, and asset recovery um, uh, Antonio let, let me ask you you a question live we, we are we are no longer recording um, uh, one of the one of the things that I've been curious about um, in the discussions is uh, so so we classified and we talked about waste as something that's that's undesirable, that's, um, yeah, that, that's, that has a negative value, but that's of course not always the case, right? We have, we, we frequently talk about waste that's recyclable. And uh, now as we, as we read news, for example, about the shortage of copper and things like that, the value of recyclables is presumably increasing. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about this uh, if you want aberration perhaps inside the, the waste trade that some part of the waste trade um, of course in fact has value yes yes of course of course waste are both cost and value and the difference depends on the on the tip on the treatment on the kind of uh, the treatment if you if you um, do a good treatment you you have to uh, pay must uh, much more money so the difference is uh, very slightly between cost and value uh, at this moment the traffic the traffickers they try to get some different kind of waste that are just uh, separated waste and they try to put this kind of waste for example scrap metal or, scrap, or, or, or for example equipment electronic waste or paper or glasses into the black market because they don't pay the money for for a right treatment this is a, this is the difference they if if in the past they just threw it away in the in the, in the sea, for example, in the lake, in the, in the field, in a legal dump. Now they get the separate waste. They 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 move this kind of waste into facilities for simulated operation treatment. That really happened. In the reality, they 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 don't treat the the. The, the waste. It uh, is uh, it. Uh, th this is a kind of a counterfeiting document. They serve to the traffickers uh, for uh, money laundering, for uh, tax evasion. They, because they try to to show that uh, the cost, that the uh, tre treatment at, uh, activity, that doesn't happen in the reality. So at this moment, the dark circular economy is the main focus for the legal traffic of traffickers of waste. And they try to, to, to take advantage of, uh, of a dumping, environmental dumping, try to take advantage of, uh, between the different legislation, for example. Uh, they use always, they try to use the corruption of, for specific false counterfeit document, but sometimes they don't need the, the green corruption because they just uh, uh, make a, a wrong classification in their own uh, ways. So uh, our challenge is to move the approach uh, from the, 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 the final, uh, from the investigation, to at the top of the supply chain in order to find a vulnerability, in order to fight in a, uh, uh, with the risk assessment, uh, risk profile, and, and so on. This is, this is, this is, a, this is our, our challenge at this moment. I hope my English is quite good for you. So sorry. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. 
Um, okay, so we're almost out of time. Um, I, I was going to ask the inevitable question that that uh, happens uh, to be asked in all these these webinars, which is uh, how has COVID affected the situation? Um, and I will ask it, but but I just wanted to note that we went an hour and 13 minutes until COVID was mentioned, which I think must be a record in any kind of webinar these days. So Payazid, you preempted me a little bit by mentioning the challenges in regards to getting, getting suspects uh, into court. Um, but um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but clearly we're able to to have these discussions without the topic. Um, but let, let me come back to this for a second because the, the limitation in, in physical movements uh, um, has had very significant impact on some types of illicit trade. Um, uh, but I wonder if, if that is the case here as well uh, on the trade itself, but also, uh, and then the, uh, the other element here, of course, being the inspection regimes and ability of law enforcement to function effectively how has that been curtailed or affected uh, in any way by, by the result of COVID-19 and the lockdowns associated? And this is really the question for everybody. So I, I don't know who, who wants to go first or who has some, some comments about this. Maybe you can just unmute yourself. Nancy, um, please yeah, come yeah. <laughs> um, so indeed, when when the when COVID epidemic started uh, in yeah March uh, last year, uh, what we did in, in within the European um, Union countries is we held uh, frequent um, calls with the inspectors uh, located in other countries to to ask them about the impacts that they saw uh, due to at, at that moment all uh, transport were, were stopped. So in the beginning of the pandemic, we saw an increase of illegal storage of waste uh, and in some cases it led to some some fires because of yeah due to lack of proper facilities to store the waste uh, but later on uh, shipments started to happen again and then indeed we we had to come to the conclusion that inspectors could not go out in the fields to do the uh, to do the inspections uh, and and that uh, had, has had a quite a significant impact on, on yeah on the on the level of inspections and now it's, it's starting to happen, but um, there was indeed a reduction in the inspection regime in the second half of, of last year. And of course, another impact is that you see uh, uh, new waste streams coming up or you see uh, waste being more mixed, of course, with hospital waste or with the masks or with gloves or an in, in, in a, a big increase of single use uh, plastic products again, unfortunately. So th those are some of the impacts that we saw on the waste trade. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Payazid, do you want to talk maybe briefly about uh, how it's affected your, your ability to, to inspect and, and investigate uh, criminals? I... Yes, uh, yes, of course. Since the, uh, during the pandemic on COVID-19, we have the challenge to uh, related to go to the site uh, to take the investigation of uh, many cases so uh, some uh, sometimes we also uh, if we uh, invite the uh, witness uh, for example to to give the uh, statement sometimes they, uh, they, they cannot attend uh, to our inv uh, invitation so sometimes uh, so some of our cases also be become uh, longer than uh, it should be. So really, the uh, this uh, COVID nineteen uh, make the uh, our uh, everyday task in investigation is really uh, I have, we face the uh, challenge on that. I thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's very reasonable to me, certainly. And I know the situation in Indonesia is, is particularly challenging these days. So we all wish, um, wish that that improves quickly and that you, your family and your staff are safe, Payazid. Um, uh, okay, uh, Ailsa, Antonio, did you want to add anything to this? But thank you. Sorry. 
Thanks, Johanny. Um, just to say, we haven't done any work um, at the FETF level on the specific impacts of COVID on environmental crime risks, but we have done extensive work on the, on the impact on money laundering risks more generally and on organised crime. And you can access that on the public FETF website. Um, and some of the key themes are an emergence of fraud, online fraud um, during the pandemic. Um, as well as cash stockpiling as criminal organized groups uh, were struggling to move cash across the borders. Um, from, that, from the wildlife trade discussions, I know that it's had some impact as well on movement of um, wildlife, illegal wildlife goods across borders. So it's likely, it's, we can assume it probably is having similar impacts on the, the waste trafficking market as well. Yes, in either maybe, <laughs> Did the worst uh, the Italian Parliament, for example, because of a uh, few two two years ago they approved uh, uh, a law that uh, limited the the time for the for the border control by the Italian custom, for example, because uh, the, the, the the economic sector and the, the, the politicians they were they they were very disagreed about the, um, about the control in the board because more control are less money for who who uh, manage uh, the harbor uh, and uh, at the moment into the globalization so they did worse than uh, covid unfortunately sometimes we're our own worst enemies um all right, uh, so um, thank you everybody for your, your inputs. Uh, we're, we're just about out of time. Um, I wanted to, to thank all of you again. Um, I think it's been a fantastically interesting conversation, uh, certainly for me to learn so much from you uh, on this really overlooked uh, crime um, that I, I hope it can bring some more, some more attention to it. Uh, and I look forward to being in touch with all of you as our various work streams, work streams develop. Um, so thank you again. And also thank you to, to my colleagues, uh, Monica and Tara, who, who managed this behind the scenes uh, incredibly well. Um, and uh, we're, we're going on a bit of a summer break. We have the, the next session, which will continue our Indonesia theme. Um, where we are currently uh, together with a, a leading polling group called uh, LSI are conducting a household survey um, of uh, 2000 Indonesian citizens, uh, as well as in-depth interviews with business sector representatives to get a better understanding about the linkages between environmental uh, degradation and corruption in, in the public's perception. And so we're focusing on uh, fisheries, uh, mining, uh, plantation slash uh, forests, and and also the waste trade. So stay tuned for that. Uh, please feel free to to register for it. It will take place on the 18th of August. Um, and in the meantime, for those of you in the northern hemisphere, uh, I wish you a pleasant summer, uh, and uh, I hope to see everybody soon. And thanks again for everybody's participation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.